And thank you very much for recording this in progress. So who is on the phone? Lisa Quivers. <gasps> Lisa, it's good to Hi, have you. We have to uh, get together. You've been through a lot lately, so thank yes, you for joining yes, us. But I'm but I'm back now. So um, Go ahead. Lisa, and, I'm you and I'm retired. So yeah. Oh, you're officially it. retired. It is September. You were saying. Yeah. Okay. Good. Send the date so we can get together. Something. Okay. Uh, okay. I, I just yeah. Do you want to introduce yourself, Lisa, so that we people can know a bit who you are as a retiree? Oh. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Lisa Quivers. Um, just a a. Uh, uh, Retired public servant and uh, community volunteer supporting the IDEA Council in their endeavors. Thank you, Lisa. Josh, how about you introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm Josh Lee. I'm the police chief here in Westchester. Uh, kind of new to the IDEA Council here, but uh, happy to be a part of it. Thank you, Josh. And Terry. I am Terry Edgar, Senior VP of Branch Operations for the YMCA of Greater Brandywine. My main office is in Westchester, and I've been on the IDEA Council for, I think, about two years. Sounds right. And LaToya is here. LaToya, how are you doing, my darling? And well, oh, it's good to see you. I'm well. Thank you. Um, my name is LaToya Myers. I'm a public health strategist. I also am a community volunteer out of the Kennett Square area. I am on the school board as well as the Chester County um, Board of Health. I'm glad you're here and you are back. This is great. Ajene, uh, can you introduce yourself? Absolutely. Hello, everyone. My name is Ajene Livingston. I'm a part of the Community Foundation team helping out with Outreach for 250 and a couple other endeavors. Thank you. And uh, do I have anybody else who's on the IDEA Council? And I'm wondering, Ed, uh, if you want to enter. Oh, Paige and uh, Emily are on the Community Foundation team working our uh, PowerPoint and stuff. And uh, Ed, you want to introduce your team? Or how would you like to deal with that? Yeah, I'll introduce myself and then I'll uh, have the team just go through quick introductions. My name is Ed Callahan. I'm the Chief Human Resources Officer for Chester County Hospital and have recently taken over the leadership of presenting to this group uh, since Dr. Karen Pinsky is now serving as our interim CEO for the hospital. Um, so I, I'll do it in order on my screen here. So Tassetti, did you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Tassetti Donald. I am one of the critical care pharmacists here at CCH. Thank you. And Sharon? Hi, everyone. Um, I am Sharon Scott. I am the uh, Quality and Patient Safety Director here at Chester County Hospital. Thank you, Sharon. Melissa? Hi, I'm Melissa Spar. I'm the Director for Clinical Performance and Operations, and um, more importantly, our Disease Team Coordinator Director. So I focus in on um, our most uh, vulnerable populations who are frequently readmitted and, uh, you know, come back to the hospital most often. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Cook? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am uh, Dr. Cook. I am the new medical director for DEI at CCH. Um, I recognize some of the, the names in the room from different like collaborations, but um, happy, happy Thursday. Thank you. <laughs> and then uh, Michelle Francis. Yeah, hi, I'm Michelle Francis. I'm the director of community health and wellness responsible for our outreach efforts here at the hospital. And I also oversee diabetes and nutrition services at the hospital. Thank you. I just noticed that Myra Castillo has joined us. Myra, would you be able to introduce yourself? And hi, glad you're here. Sure. Yes, hi, I'm Myra Castillo. I am the supervisor, uh, official title is program area coordinator with the Migrant Education Program of Chester County. Glad you're here, Myra. So thank you for uh, joining us today for the Chester County Hospitals Community Advisory Board meeting of our IDEA Council. Did everybody get a chance to introduce themselves? If I missed anybody, speak now. Okay, as folks zoom in a bit more, so we'll let, but why don't we turn it over to you? Okay, and we have till you. one o'clock at the latest because people are, so uh, we're just doing noon to one today, by the way. Okay, great. 
Paige, if you could go to the next slide. Uh, so as I mentioned, um, Dr. Pinsky uh, has taken on the interim CEO role here at the hospital. So I'll be serving as the executive sponsor uh, for this group moving forward. Um, and then what we wanted to do today, I'll go over a couple of things. We wanted to recap what we shared in April. Also, uh, Tassetti is going to go over a presentation about the impact of medication access on preventable admissions. Of course, uh, the most important discussion and idea sharing, and then we'll talk about our, our next meeting and hopefully what we plan to share. So if you could go to the next slide, Paige. Uh, Dr. Cook uh, introduced herself, but I just wanted to highlight that we have recently uh, appointed Dr. Cook as the medical director for diversity, equity, and inclusion. So her and I will be working closely together on a variety of initiatives uh, with other individuals in the organization, including our DEI council, to really understand where we need to focus our DEI efforts, both for our employees, the community we serve, and then other stakeholders, of course, including our patients. So happy to have Dr. Cook as a partner and, and she's been off the ground and running and, and doing a lot of work and looking into a lot of things. So excited to work with her in that role. You could go to the next slide, Paige. Um, since our last meeting, I'll talk quickly about the uh, podcast that Dr. Pinsky and I had uh, done and then I'll ask Michelle Francis to share some of our outreach initiatives. Dr. Pinsky and I were able to uh, connect through this group with uh, Liam and Eric and were able to be on the Start Local podcast. So we did that and talked about our healthcare operations here, but also how that intertwines with well-supported staff and really focusing on, you know, when we take care of our staff, we know that they can then take care of our patients. And so how do we do that? What are we looking to do in the future? So it was a great opportunity. The first podcast I've ever done and Liam and Eric made it very easy. So I was happy to participate in that. And I'll turn it over to you, Michelle, if you want to talk about some of our outreach initiatives and what might be coming up. Sure. Great. Thank you. So I know, um, we, uh, I know some of this is in the past and some of it's in the future. So as you can see here, um, we did a mental health in the black community. That was with Sharon Harden, who probably many of you know, she is very active in the community. Um, she's a minority nurse educator. She helps volunteer for many programs for us. She's also NAACP on their wellness, head of the wellness committee, uh, multiple roles. And so she she did a great job presenting that information because she has also involvement with this ACEs for trauma-informed care. Uh, we're doing some programs in Spanish, as you can see. What I realized after I already submitted my slides too is we also have a program um, speaking of trauma-informed care on trauma and resilience at the um, Spanish-speaking church um, of uh, Good Samaritan in Westchester on Sunday where we're expecting 40 people and we're also going to be providing a, a box lunch for that program. Um, and another one I'll highlight on here is on Saturday, we had the Men's Health Matters Symposium, which was at the Moose Lodge in Coatesville, uh, uh, targeting males. Um, and we we had a not a gr as great of a response as we'd hoped, but we did have 13 highly engaged men who were able to get prostate cancer blood testing uh, screening, uh, take home fit kits to be able to be mailed into Penn. And it was all in partnership with Penn Downtown and the grant funding that they have for that. And they could also get blood pressure and BMI. The minority nurse educators were there as well for that. And we did provide a catered lunch for that group as well. And we had three physicians um, who spoke and did education. Um, so it was really a great program and a nice venue. Um, and then on October 20th, we have Check Your Meds, which ties in with Tassetti's uh, talk today. It was one of the programs we designed uh, because of some of the problems we have with medications in the community that we hope to get your input on today. So I actually have a meeting this afternoon to help finalize that, but we're working with the church in Coatesville, ideally going to be there on that Sunday after church um, to, uh, have a meet the pharmacist, uh, and to have your meds checked and also be able to, um, you know, potentially return medications that day. And then we have some cardiovascular heart track screenings, which we have one at, uh, CYWA in Coatesville on October 28th. And then we have one also at the Melton Center. So that includes glucose testing, cholesterol, LDL, um, 
and triglycerides and also uh, uh, body mass index with weight, BMI and blood pressure. Uh, all guests entered into the American College of Cardiology algorithm to determine a 10 year risk. And then everyone gets to meet with a one-on-one -on -one with a nurse educator after that. So lots of good things coming up, um, hopefully targeting uh, this population. Thanks. Oh yeah, forgot. <laughs> then on uh, Saturday, uh, Friday, October 25th, we're, we are offering a free breast screening event at Fernhill. We're doing this in conjunction with LCH, Health and Community Services, Chest Pen, and then some of our Pen Primary Care Practices. We actually have 22 slots um, that we're filling for women who meet the criteria on the screen that I'm not going to read, but um, basically for under or un, I see that's spelled wrong, uninsured, sorry about that, women. Um, and we do have interpreter services. We're going to be providing transportation. It includes education. If they need a follow-up test, uh, it's all included in the program, uh, including if, and, uh, you know, hopefully not, but diagnosis and treatment if needed. Thank you. And I think um, Tassetti is going to take it from here. And to say we have until one o'clock, as Karen mentioned, so we'll go through your presentation and then get some feedback from the group. Yes, and so what I wanted to start off with is just that I wanted to keep my part of the presentation brief because I'm really interested in having, um, hearing from you and learning from you, learning from you so that we can have a dynamic um, conversation. So what I will say, um, patient stories we know are so important, um, not only to the patient experience, but also to the provider experience. Um, and like I said here, it's an opportunity to really see how that how that care is impactful, but also can see, um, can highlight where there may be gaps in that care and what we can do to um, improve that. So I don't know if Michelle or Dr. Cook, if you wanted to just share a very briefly your patient story that we can kind of think about as I go through the rest of my presentation. Go ahead, Dr. Cook. Absolutely. So I think that um, when thinking about uh, like medication um, compliance and how we think about medication adherence, um, a lot of times we um, tend to think about a, a adults, but as a pediatrician, I was talking to the group um, last week, and I think that what I've been seeing more and more is that the fact that parents are coming in um, with sick kids, and they're, the, the reason why they're sick is because they have to ration their medications, right? So the reality is that for a lot of our um, community members, that you have to make a choice, and unfortunately, that choice is do I you know, Dr. Cook, do I buy uh, dinner or provide dinner for my whole entire family or do I uh, give my kid, my son, um, you know, his albuterol inhaler or his flovid inhaler as instructed? And I, I think we as providers don't do a great job um, at peeling back the layers of the onion, right? We are quick to put on labels like, right, this non-compliant patient or um, this patient is admitted for being, you know, non-adherent to his, his or her regimen, but um, it's up for us to to really kind of like be curious and figure out like where we fail in them as a system. All right, um, we can go to the next slide. Thanks Paige. So what I love about this slide um, really is that it shows how often a patient engages in um, different parts of healthcare and how every single time they're engaging with healthcare, there's an opportunity for those medications to be adjusted, to be changed. And depending on that patient's care team and how engaged that patient is um, with their healthcare, sometimes there are opportunities where the care providers and the specialists, they know everything that's happening. Even when they're in different health systems, they're using different pharmacies, different providers, they know. However, for many patients, they have various providers, various specialists that are not necessarily speaking to each other um, in, in this kind of circle of the healthcare system. And so when it comes to those medication lists, when we're stopping medication, starting and making those adjustments, they don't always flow through as they do in this you know, pretty picture here. It's not always so pretty. Um, next slide, please, Paige. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to use this slide to just highlight some of those challenges that are associated with those medications. Um, so I'm not going to read every single one, but I just wanted to highlight um, drug drug interactions um, are happen often. Um, adverse drug reactions. There are many times where medications are stopped and started because a patient has had um, an interaction and really trying to assess, you know, what what was that medication and, you know, 
depending on that adverse reaction, are we going to stop? Are we going to start that medication? When we're stopping or starting medications, you know, of course, these are things that need to be reported to various providers. And sometimes, um, you know, it's not as seamless. So drug choice problems and um, in terms of like errors and substitutions, obviously there have also on the outpatient side and the inpatient side, inpatient side, excuse me, there are drug shortages as well, um, which can definitely impact when you're prescribing those medications and you know this patient needs that certain medication, but it is a national shortage. And then last but certainly not least, um, which I think Dr. Hook, you were alluding to, you know, we do, there are patients who are admittedly non-adherent, but there are times that that non-adherence is really just not really understanding um, the, their disease state or the seriousness of, you know, complications when you're stopping and starting medications um, as well. And then also what's not here is just obviously financial barriers or transportation. You can go to the next slide, thank you. Um, so as you guys know, I am a pharmacist here at Chester County Hospital. So of course, I'm always looking for opportunities on how the pharmacist can impact transitions of care. Um, and I think pharmacists have a very unique um, position in that we can impact this, whether you're on the outpatient side, the community side, and in acute care. And as you can see, sometimes that is various ways. Medication reconciliations that are happening at every point of that patient engaging in the engaging in healthcare, um, making sure that we are following up with providers, whether it's inpatient or outpatient. And last but not least is patient education and making sure when we are starting and stopping those medications that patients and their families are aware um, of what to do as well. And I just wanted to highlight some of the um, World Health Organization statistics here. Um, 25 to 80% of patients had at least one medication discrepancy or failure to communicate in hospital medication changes at discharge. Next slide, please. Um, so really what I wanted to point out here is, again, when we're thinking about that picture or that wheel, how many times a patient can engage with the healthcare system. And where those gaps can be. So sometimes it can start at home. Um, and that could be various reasons. Um, patients without homes or, you know, um, you know, steady home, steady home environment or financial issues. Um, when patients are switching from an inpatient to an outpatient SNF um, or nursing home. And also when patients are going into and out of the hospital, kind of making sure we're communicating with their PCP. Um, and so sometimes there are gaps where providers really did not know that their patient was in the hospital for two weeks, right? So that, that can, and medications were changed. And so that can cause a problem. And obviously when patients are coming in um, into our ED um, and not really having a strong medication list or even a strong uh, understanding of the medications that they take at home. And of course, this is kind of my bread and butter, uh, medication, medication changes during hospitalization. You would be surprised that patients may come in on no medications and leave with 15, or they come in with 15 and then we've added five more. So, you know, it kind of runs the gamut. And discharge, med discharge medications, again, really highlighting that so many changes can happen on the acute care side and really trying to make sure that we close that loop there on um, discharge medications and kind of who's, who's involved in that. Is it the pharmacist? Is it the, is it the nurse? Um, is it the provider? And I will say um, there have been times where I have um, counseled patients myself, um, but really we definitely do rely on our nurses to do some of that depending on the medication. And of course, one of the biggest things is cost. Um, really what I've seen um, on the adult side is the issue when we're starting these anticoagulants, although a lot and antiplatelets, although a lot of those medications I'm sure you guys are probably aware of have been on the market for a while, um, regardless of your insurance, sometimes they can still be cost prohibitive cost prohibitive. And if you do not have insurance, they are definitely cost prohibitive. Um, antibiotics, especially some of the newer antibiotics, um, some of the newer PO antibiotics, um, insurances, you know, are, are not um, really happy to pay for. And then especially if we are also trying to discharge a patient on IV antibiotics, right, because then that's additional um, services that will be needed. And really, um, another area I'm really involved in is our anti-diabetic um, agents where we have a lot of new diabetics um, who may who may be underinsured um, or no insurance and insulin can also still be cost prohibitive. So I did just want to take a moment to kind of highlight what we have available um, here at CCH and just in general um, to 
to really kind of combat that. Um, so one of the things I will talk about, um, like I highlighted, a med, a med Excuse me, I'm so excited. I can't talk now. Admission medication reconciliation by the pharmacist or pharmacy techs. When a patient comes into our, our ED, we do our best to have a pharmacist or a pharmacy tech really confirm those medications to the best of their ability. You know, we are talking to patients. We are talking to families. We're calling PCPs. We are, call I just called the VA actually right before I came into this meeting. Um, so we are doing the best that we can because we know that if that list is confirmed and clarified, that when that, when we review that with that provider, we can then have a discussion about what should be started and what should be stopped. Um, also meds to beds. Um, we do our best to make sure that patients leave here with their medications because we know that if it is not convenient, there is a possibility that they may never pick up that medication. And then obviously also talking about the cost of medications. So one of the things that we encourage our providers to do is to e-prescribe the prescriptions down to our outpatient pharmacy so that the patient can pick it up when they're walking out of the door. Um, and then I will talk about the low cost options on the other slide, but I just wanted to punt to Michelle to um, give us some feedback on the others. Okay, yeah, well, we already addressed the Check Your Meds program. The medication take back, our hospital, um, usually twice a year, we run, run a community program where people in the community can bring back their unused medications. And there's a whole list. Um, and we actually, in our emergency room entrance, we have a box that, that people can drop stuff off at any time, uh, you know, ideally to get rid of meds that you aren't using or shouldn't be using and don't want around. Um, we have uh, many support groups for our chronic diseases, uh, CHF, um, COPD, diabetes, and quite often there is education. We have a pharmacy program coming up um, for one of those. So we do try to do outreach and education um, via our support groups and other programs. Um, the FQHC, the Federal Qualified Health Centers, I'm on the Healthcare Quality Committee for LCH, and I know they are working on this too. As as um, was mentioned, said he mentioned, you know, during these transitions of care, you know, some of these patients from LCH leave our ED or leave our hospital. There's changes, so they actually have some really great policies in place too to work with Chester County Hospital to make sure um, that happens. Um, patient portals. Um, I I realize the importance of this. I'm um, my husband unfortunately has been very ill recently, and it's been interesting, and I'm really grateful to have him on the pen portal because I can see things. I recently found a medication error on his portal. I was able to communicate um, to the doctor and get an error corrected. So, uh, which was great. So, you know, getting people in the community to be aware of how to get on the portal, how to use the portal. And I know that not everyone has access to that, but it, it is certainly a um, tool that we can use as well. Thanks. Thanks, Michelle. And I did also want to just say, um, I forgot to point out early authorization of high cost meds. We do um, working with a provider and case management and social work. If we know that a patient may need a high cost item, we try to address that earlier on in the admission so that, you know, we're not kind of scrambling towards the end of towards the end of the admission um, and delaying the discharge. And hopefully we are able to, you know, the provider is able to submit all of that paperwork and the insurance is able to get back to us so that we can, you know, know what the price is of that medication and get it approved so that it doesn't delay their discharge. Next slide, please. So these are a couple of um, modes that we use for patients who are under, under or uninsured, excuse me. Um, so GoodRx, I know that almost everyone is aware of GoodRx or different types of coupon cards where you can just go online, you know, type in your medication and it'll give you um, a discounted price. Uh, there are manufacturer pro provider discount prescription cards and programs, specifically the ones that um, I have used and have suggested to be used is for our anticoagulants, particularly Apixaban. Um, also, again, Walmart low cost prescription program, they, a lot of medications, um, commonly used medications are on the $4 list. Um, I also wanted to also add that Walmart also does have its own insulin. Um, and so that is something that we have also um, directed some of our patients there as well. Um, for CCH specifically, in terms of like actual like policies and guidelines that we have, we do have a take-home medication policy. Um, so we're able to dispense medications 
that may delay, you know, delay discharge or may, you know, increase the patient's chance of readmission. And also, you know, if they're if they are without this medication, may increase, you know, their their chance of morbidity and mortality. So really the, the policy is surrounding insulin and inhalers. So um, if I know that a patient is indigent and cannot afford their insulin, what I will do is that we can dispense the insulin pen that he was prescribed inpatient, and I can send that patient home with that insulin pen at no cost. And same with our inhalers. I believe with the inhalers, it is really albuterol, but really that policy, if we feel that the, there are medications outside of insulin and albuterol inhalers, we can have you know discussion case by case um, that we can send that patient home you know, with five day supply of this or you know, a 10 day supply of that to ensure um, that they have those medications when they get out the door. I feel like I was speaking very quickly, but like I said, I really wanted to uh, make sure we had a really great conversation. And I believe the next slide is going to be about our discussion. There we go. So, does anyone have any first thoughts before we kind of use some of these question prompts? This stuff is hard. It okay. looks like you have so much in line, and yet I know so many people who have such a hard time when they're ill getting through yeah. and dealing with stuff. I'm hoping, uh, like Latoya, you might be able to help us flesh this out a bit. You have so much experience in this area. I think I see a hand as well. Oh, uh, go ahead. I don't have everything on my screen. Myra. Myra, yeah. So we um, we work uh, very closely with LCH for MEP student referrals for free vaccinations and uh, free physicals. Um, and this was a collaboration that we worked out with the Chester County Health Department. Um, in the past, we used to be able to take students to the health department to get their vaccines and physicals that they needed in order to get them enrolled in school. And since we've had this collaboration, it, it makes it a little bit easier for the families to go here locally and get to know LCH. And then the idea is to have them become patients with LCH. And I know that they they do a really great job in terms of serving the students and the parents and medication being one of those things that they make sure that they walk out with the prescription and that they can go out to get it at their local pharmacy. Um, I know that they don't have prescriptions in the office, but at least they really do a good job with being able to help the families financially so that one, they can get a really low cost service and a really low cost um, medication. But LCH right now is the only clinic in the area that we work with, aside obviously with, with you when um, our patients go to any of your local um, offices here in, in Chester County. Um, but that is, is still a, a real backup for many of our Hispanic families. Whenever they have an emergency, they're really scared to go to the emergency room. Um, they don't want to go to an urgent care because they know that if they go to an urgent care, they're charged up to $200 just for the visit. And a lot of times they don't have that money to pay up front. So they're very reluctant to go to emergency care or to go to um, one of the uh, walk-in clinics. And so then that leads to further pain that is unattended. And then eventually they do end up having to go to the emergency room. Um, we, we do tell them that if they go to the emergency room, at least they're able to uh, work with them to create a payment plan for the visits. But of course the medication is something else and something that they still need to pay for. And we have especially many families from Guatemala that do a lot of home remedies um, because they cannot afford medication. Uh, and, and we did recently have, uh, unfortunately, the death of a child um, that was given a home medication rather than to be treated for what it was. Um, the child was, was kicked and, and then died from, from the physical violence that the child received. But initially to treat that child First of all, they didn't take them to the emergency room. And then by the time they took that child to the emergency room, um, the child passed away. And it was at that point that they discovered that that child was given a home remedy to try to alleviate some of the pain that the child had suffered. 
Um, and we have other cases of other families where we hear that, that they take home medications, they go to the grocery stores and they buy medications that are brought in from Guatemala or from Mexico. And so they're taking over the counter medication that they prescribe themselves because they cannot afford to go to the doctor, they cannot afford to go get treatment, and they cannot afford medication. Um, so I wanted to thank you for continuing this because it, it does give us some hope. Um, and again, like I said, we work very closely with LCH, but there's still not enough information out there for our families as to what they can and should do. Um, and, and sometimes I feel like we're forcing them to say, you have to go to the emergency room. If you cannot afford to go to urgent care, go to the emergency room because by the time you get there, it may be too late if you don't. But they're still very reluctant because we do have um, still a high number of families that are undocumented that are very afraid. And that's not just in the Guatemalan community. That's Guatemala, Venezuela, Mexico, El Salvador, all of the families that, that we're having coming into the area. Thanks for sharing that. Terry? Sure. Um, I just would like to start by saying um, I am not sick, but I have to take one pill a day. And I often forget to take it. And I have to keep some of my desk. So I think this is a universal issue, but certainly there are people that um, have more challenges than others. Um, I have a family member, my younger sister had a stroke about three years ago, and she takes a lot of medication. And one of the things that we've recognized is that um, she didn't get a lot of information about the impact of the meds on things that she wanted to be able to do. And I don't know that the communication was great. And I don't know that the doctors even knew how the medication was going to impact her. And it took her finally getting with a pharmacist to help her understand why some of those medications were doing what they were doing, but what those medications were also helping her to not have happen. So not having another stroke is more important than some of these other side effects. So I think the the way that we sometimes communicate, and I'm just basing this on my personal experience because I don't have a lot of experience in healthcare. Um, it's very complicated and it's I know there are probably legalities that you have to go over. And I know I leave the pharmacy with like 10 pages of potential side effects, but I think the communication in, you know, and I've worked with Michelle before and I know she she's able to communicate things in a very clear and um, simple way with folks so they can understand things. I think that's an opportunity beyond just those people that are, that are maybe in these difficult positions. Um, so I don't know if that's something that the healthcare providers have given thought to, but I think it might be an opportunity across the board around how do we communicate with folks so they can understand and maybe spend a little more time on that piece because that might help with some of the compliance. Just my, my two cents, just as a person who has very little to any expertise in this field. So I'll just put that out there. Terry, can I respond to that really quick? Um, I'm I think just taking notes. If you, if I, that's why I'm not talking. So I'm just taking oh, notes. Sorry to say that real quick, because if I don't say it, I'm going to forget it. But I think, Terry, I think that you mentioned um, an important, important point, um, just dealing with like medicine in general, um, that we have to figure out what's important to the patient. Like, right? Like, so every, every story has a patient. Every patient has a story. Every um, patient has something or, or someone, hopefully, that they are... Um, willing to do something for, or it could be an activity, it could be a family member, but we have to figure out and um, takes time to hear that, right? It takes that time to process and to ask. Um, and sometimes again, the the structure and how we're, the time that we're allowed, it doesn't always allow for that, unfortunately. But I think that you hit a, um, a very pivotal point. I think that once we learn to start figuring out what's important to this patient, we will get more buy-in. Um, more buying from the patient. Um, so I think you made, that was a very important point. Thank you. Hi, this is Lisa Quivers on the phone. I, I can't raise my hand. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. Yep, we can um, hear you, Lisa. You for, okay, great. Thank you for the, um, for the presentation. Um, you know, like I said, listening to it is, is very good, sometimes better than just watching the slides. Um, but I have two questions. The first one is um, regarding seniors, um, since we're talking about um, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. Um, and so one of the things with seniors, you know, that oftentimes they will take a lot of medication, but um, 
and I know that there are patient advocates oftentimes in the in the hospitals, but you know they often are not computer savvy. So the um, having the um, the portal, which I love, is not you know feasible all the time for them unless they have a you know family member or somebody that can assist with that, and they're willing to share that data. And then secondly, um, just understanding you know everything that they need to understand with regards to paperwork. And I, you know, I know that's part of the role of the patient advocate, but I'm just wondering where that fits into to the plan. And then secondly, my second question is, um, are the materials that you provide when people leave the hospital provided in multiple languages? I know in my, you know, in my previous life, you know, we, we, pay, we were very aware of the languages that were spoken in the area and provided information um, in various languages. Legally, we had to do that. But, you know, that is a start if interpreter services are not available or something like that. So I'm just wondering how that is addressed. Um, I will say um, in terms of seniors, and obviously I, I can only speak from the pharmacy perspective. Um, when we recognize that a patient may not, or it, actually all patients, when we are doing any type of like discharge counseling or admission med record or anything like that, we do, we can and will provide the patient with um, a paper list of their medications. So even if they have never set up their portal, um, you know, they will always have a paper list on their discharge ABS. Now, granted, the discharge after visit summary is full of paperwork. Um, it's a lot of pages, but their medication list is in there. Um, I also have personally created um, medication lists for patients where I feel like, oh, you know, he doesn't really understand, he or she is not really understanding what's going on, where I've created uh, personalized uh, medication lists with the name of the medication, frequency, so on and so forth, you know, why they're on that medication, you know, putting a sun for morning, um, when, you know, really recognizing if a patient just needs a little bit more assistance in that area, and where that discharge ABS may not always be um, as robust. Um, but I do know that we do have patient advocates um, but I just have not worked, you know, closely with them um, in this aspect. Um, in terms of the different languages, to my knowledge, I, oh, yeah, I, can, I can take that. I can take that one if you like. We can change languages, but again, I am limited there in terms of pharmacy. I know we um, can change language, change to Spanish and other languages, but I'm not full, not aware of the full uh, range. Yeah, um, we can change to many different languages. Um, I'm not, I, I'm not sure of the full scope, but we have a variety of languages um, that spans uh, many. And so um, I can honestly tell you that um, our written information that we offer to our patients is available in a wide variety of languages. And, and I, I don't know that we find many on a daily basis that we can't meet the written needs of our patients. What I will tell you though, and this kind of circles back to what's been identified um, with our community needs and kind of our community offerings is a single instance and, and a single instance of education is usually not enough for patients. And so while they're in the hospital for, you know, four, five, six days, um, while they're seeing many different providers, while they're seeing many different healthcare providers, consultants, um, and they're usually not in their best state of mind during that time either. There's a lot going on. That's that's a hard time to, to take in new information and learn. And so um, we, do, we do attempt to provide them with education. We do attempt to provide them with written education, but that's not usually the best time to retain that information. And so um, we really do try, and Michelle's team, you know, does a great job of providing additional outreach to patients and our community um, to offer all of these resources so that we can kind of hug back and, and regroup with them on the most important needs that we feel like our community has. Um, but to Michelle's point that she made earlier, we struggle with, you know, getting outreach and getting, you know, enough people to come to those so we feel like we can, you know, meet the needs of the community in the best way. So um, while we do feel like we have 
uh, you know, a wide variety of languages available. And when we find that we don't have a language available, there are, I can tell you, tickets put in so that we can meet those needs. Um, the single instance of the hospitalization is, is a difficult time to meet every educational demand that those patients have. And so we can send them home with written information, but as you've all identified, there are more needs that grow um, beyond that discharge time. And so um, we're looking to you to help us identify how we can gain, um, you know, better, better, you know, insights into getting people out to these community events so that we can reach our community after they've been discharged, you know, um, so that we can get them using their portal if they struggle to use it, using these community resources. And I'm gonna stop talking now. Um, but yeah, we we do our best while we're while they're here, but Michelle's group really hugs them, you know, well afterwards too. Um, I don't know who was first, maybe Josh? Or Anjane, I'm sorry, I didn't see who was I think Anjane was up first. Yeah, I apologize. No worries. I what I did was I put my hand up and then took it back down. Oh, uh, <laughs> as, as people as people were speaking, uh, my thought felt less impactful because everyone was hitting the points that I wanted to say. Um, but um, Melissa, as you were speaking, I I sort of feel like exploring the our community partners and our collaborations uh, can really help. Um, give us more traction and more reach uh, because similar to you know what Myra was talking about when she started uh, having trusted advocates uh, in, in the community to help foster that relationship uh, so it's not so the, the the language barrier is sort of the overt barrier but there's a cultural and there's you know more subtle barriers in terms of, of communication um, and Melissa, you really hit it on the head where um, the language and the thought and the reinforcement can happen at times uh, where the person is not in a um, crisis state. So um, exploring uh, our current partners to help with communication in both ways, not only to get people to the services that's needed, but also uh, get the opportunities to the people as well by having our community partners who have already established relationships within the community to, uh, to let them know what's out there, but also to encourage them to take advantage of the opportunities that uh, we're providing. And Josh. I think my comment just kind of dovetails with a lot of what I've heard, but like from a, uh, a personal experience and then seeing what people struggle with, you know, my family, it, we're fortunate that we don't really have, there are, no, there are few, if any, barriers um, to, you know, to quality health care for us. Um, but we have a son who uh, who's 12 and has has struggled with, uh, with asthma and uh, severe allergies and some other things. And, uh, you know, from the court, from the point when he was was just an infant, we, we got the practice of dealing with, you know, um, you know, times when you're looking at your your kid and he can't breathe and nothing more helpless as a parent when, you know, than looking at, at, at my child and he can't breathe. Uh, but it still took us months or, or years, really, to get good enough and to get him to the right places to figure, all right, this is how we control this. And then once we get it controlled to remember the medications and, and uh, the routines of the medications and what to do when he displays with certain symptoms. Like, you know, I had a whole chart written out. If, if this, then do that, then do this. And uh, um, forget about what it costs, you know, the, the thousand or two thousand dollars a month that it costs to keep those medications, um, you know, in the house. Um, and just when we got to the point where we feel like, hey, we we got this things change and then he needed new medications and then and then thank goodness he gets you know he's gotten better so now it's that routine is is there's less of a routine i guess my whole thing is um part of it at no point do i remember we've had some of the best uh the best practitioners thank goodness um but it's always the assumption when we leave the hospital 
uh, the ER in those first times, the, the doctor's offices. It's always the assumption that we know what we're doing when we leave the office or that we can afford to pay for the medicine when we leave. And thank goodness we, the, the affording part we did, the knowing what we're doing, uh, we didn't. Um, and uh, there were so many times where I thought like, I need more information and, and we would get it eventually, but because of the nature of the way things work, it, there wasn't just a phone number to call and get an answer you know, immediately. And I know I was told all the right information when we were in there, but it didn't all stick and I didn't take the right notes. And I just, I, as I ramble on, I did, that's for me. And I have the, the yeah. great access. I know for others, how much they must struggle um, yeah. because they're not as fortunate. Josh, I get that. <laughs> that's what I think all the time. <laughs> yeah. Latoya, what do you have? I don't have an answer, a solution. I just I have questions and it's so yeah, that's a patient story, you know, like you being able to share that experience, I think, you know, we have, so I think about so many of the asthmatic patients that we've had and, you know, making charts and telling them, you know, if this, then that, and, you know, speaking to parents. So I, I definitely understand. Mm. Latoya, can you unmute yourself, please? Thanks. Uh, yes. Yeah. Can, I ask, can, I, can I add something? This is Lisa real quick. I'm sorry, Latoya, I'm not seeing hands because I'm driving. But um, <laughs> the gentleman that just, just, just spoke may have offered a, you know, an, a solution or something worth exploring. I know that somebody said they were looking to us for support. And he said, there was just a number I could have called. And maybe that's not the answer, but we all know that when, when there's a health-related issue, being able to reach out to a human um, to get answers is helpful. And, our, and the pharmacies that, the pharmacists that, like, the pharmacies, CVS, whatever, are very helpful. But I don't know if the hospital has, or maybe in their long-range plan or something like that, um, where that could be some sort of availability of where people could call and get information. You know, I, I don't know what the answer is. And it may not even be a phone call, but I believe that if we remove, remove the human piece of it, that it will not be as effective. But that's just my opinion. Sorry for interrupting but I can't see hands. No worries. I was just going to piggyback on a couple other um, individuals' comments as well. Um, one thing when I kind of hear this issue is there's it's, it's kind of two separate categories in my mind. One being um, intentionally not, you know, discontinuing because of side effects or costs or like you have a kind of concrete reason why you may discontinue or not start a medication. Then you have it on the other side that it's unintentional. I forgot to take it, or I wasn't quite sure on the instructions. I wasn't. But I think a feedback loop in some way um, would be helpful in order to, for a patient, regardless of if they, uh, if it's intentional or unintentional, that they can then uh, communicate or report um, that they discontinue. Like, I'm not doing this thing. Because um, as Melissa, I think you mentioned that patients are receiving a lot of information, but there's also patients who've been there, done that, right? They're like, I've been here, I've done this, I've been dealing with this thing and I've been okay. So it's not, they're like, I'll do it again and I'll be okay next time. And until the next time is not a next time, right? Until it's too late. And so I think if there's a way to communicate the discontinuation, um, and then kind of, uh, have some type of intervention at that point, like people discontinue or don't do it or can't do it for a variety of different reasons in both those categories of intentional and unintentional, but having a way to then disrupt that, um, I think is most important. So that feedback loop in my mind might be one thing as just an initial reaction after hearing this. And then I had one question in terms of specific to the hospital, are there particular priority populations that you're seeing um, that really need additional support, um, thought, um, intervention around to uh, maybe try to increase or um, close a gap or something like that? Or is it, this is just a general, like we want to increase adherence, compliance, et cetera, across all populations? So I, I, 
I definitely think it's a twofold <laughs> question there. I think in general, yes, right, everybody. Um, but I definitely um, know for a fact for the last few years, we really have focused on heart failure, heart failure readmissions. Um, as we know, that group um, sometimes trying to manage those patients and their CHF exacerbations can be difficult. So really what we tried to, what we noticed is that with the guideline directed therapy, a lot of patients either were not on it, it was not optimized, or it was just, they were kind of lost to follow up after a discharge and now they're back. And so what we really tried to do, we had a pharmacist um, work very closely with one of our cardiologists and really kind of figure out, well, what are those gaps? What are we doing? Um, and so what that came out to is that there would be a consult to pharmacy where a patient, or excuse me, a pharmacist would then talk to the patient, get some information about their medications and kind of, well, why aren't you taking your water pill? You know, what is the issue? Just kind of asking all that information and then working with the provider to see kind of what those gaps were. And then that translated into um, the the provider having a new templated note in Epic so that when they were doing their, because we also noticed that the provider's notes were not as robust as they should be. It's like, you may have said, start this medication, but then it was never ordered, right? So, but then now you have a pharmacist who is now going back to be like, oh, hey, you said you wanted to start spironolactone. Like, can we put that order in? So what we have found, um, and then this, we had a diuretic protocol. So there's been a lot of push for pharmacy and cardi cardiology to work together for our heart failure population. Um, also identifying, again, COPD exacerbations, our COPD patients. Um, I know um, we did try to have some pharmacy involvement in that, but it really didn't come to fruition because we noticed it was more so they needed a, um, I think more of like a nurse practitioner, more of a nurse nursing assistance there. And so now they have a COPD navigator who is able to go in and talk to the patient. Because um, really from a pharmacy perspective, we were like, well, maybe there are issues with the inhalers, inhaler education, you know, those types of things. And we found that these patients, that's not, that really wasn't the issue. So we kind of removed ourselves from, from that. And then they hired a COPD navigator. So I do know for CHF and COPD, that has really been a push to um, really try to optimize the therapy that those patients that those patients are on um, or not on, and really just trying to make sure that we identify what those gaps are there. Um, and then also any of our patients who are started on a new anticoagulant or antiplatelet, we do try to counsel them. Obviously, I'm only one pharmacist, only have a handful of pharmacists, so we cannot get to everybody in terms of counseling. Um, but if a provider is like, hey, I really need you to do some additional counseling, um, with patients who are being discharged on high alert medications, a pharmacist will do that. Um, another area is our opioid use disorder patients. Um, we were lucky enough to get Narcan nasal spray from the health department. So any patient that we identify as opioid use disorder or a patient, you know, a patient, you know, sometimes they have like a continuous um, pain pump or anything like that, we will do give them free Narcan and do Narcan counseling with them or, um, you know, their caregiver or provider, or excuse me, or family member as well. So off the top of my head, those are the three initiatives that I know um, that had additional pharmacy impact um, as well. I don't know if anyone else on the line is able to chime in, but I know for a fact, those are the three areas that we've really tried to focus on um, the last few years and really, really have initiatives around, around those patients. No, you hit them, Seti, and I, I think <laughs> where, we're, where we're, the direction we're moving in is to kind of close the loop, and it was on, um, it was on to Seti's first slide, that big circle, and it's really just to, in our post-acute services, is to kind of connect the dots once patients are home, what are they still taking, and partnering with our home care services and our PCPs, and, and really ensuring that the care that we were providing in the hospital is still the care that they're getting at home and making sure that there's no gaps in that care and that the care is still appropriate. And so to your point, Latoya, you know, is, is, has the patient stopped something because they've been there, done that. Right. And, and they feel as if it was appropriate for them and they're working with their healthcare team that we've handed off to. Um, and so, it's, it's definitely a balance that we balance every day, but I, I think the direction we're headed in is really just to close those loops that we know we've identified as gaps um, 
but there are still some gaps. And I think this group has definitely hit on many of them. Um, and, and I think one of them that, and I realize we have three minutes left. One of them is our, our population of patients that really is not connected. And we've talked about this in other forums that we've had. Um, and that's really a vulnerable space for, for many of our groups. Um, and I'd really like to, to delve into, and I don't know if that's our next topic, but how do we help those people? Um, how do we help them in a, in a crisis situation? How do we help them every day outside of a crisis to avoid a crisis, right? Um, because that's kind of what I heard earlier in our discussion as a, a really critical problem for them that I don't really know how to solve and maybe we need to dive deeper into. Sharon, I see you shaking your head. I don't know if you agree or you're just nodding me off of the line because we have two minutes left. Um, I, but I, I, I totally agree, Melissa. And, and we're working very hard here at the hospital to meet the needs of those patients um, while we have them. But as you said, as it has come up in the discussion, there are also many needs that we don't, I mean, we can't meet because we don't know about them there at home. Um, I just didn't want to lose the fact that along with this slideshow, to say you added some additional slides at the end of it. I don't want to lose that point because they're more like one page takeaways and sharing of resources for you. Um, so um, I don't know if Paige, you might be able to advance the slides, but we just wanted to give it to you in a very concise right after keep going. I think there's more. No. You know, oh, yeah, here it they looks are. like they were yeah. hidden. Okay. Yeah, they're hidden. They're hiding. Oh. Yeah. yeah. What page? Make sure when we send it out to the whole group that they're not hidden. You're yes. Right. I mean, that's great. Yeah, because there's a lot of good resources that Tissetti put together, um, and that we may be able to, um, you may be able to share with the folks in your community and in your groups. How about we post them too on the um the website so that we can get them out and. I don't know, you want to look at them and see if it's appropriate for us to send out on do you want social media? Maybe Sharon, you could talk with um, Paige about that. Okay. Right. Yeah, no, I did. She put together a lot of information here and some resources. Um, oh, what, I have really quickly, what I have found is that patients really don't know how to make a medication list. Um, right. And sometimes that really is the crux of the issue and and it allows them to take a medication list to every single visit and you know they can talk about it with their home health aide or their providers and so there are just different um resources that i have used at previous um pharmacy brown bag events that i have been a part of and those are some of the resources that i um have utilized as well and so they're different you know they have aarp ismp so different um, you know, whatever floats the patient's boat, there's something in there for them. So some of them from the CDC, I'm um, in different organizations. And I think there's one more slide. No, is that the last one? This one, oh. and then this is the other one. Okay, and then the very last slide was about, or excuse me, that prescription card program, excuse me, sorry, sorry, Paige. Um, <laughs> Our programs. Um, these are things that I have utilized here with patients. Well, again, I had alluded to with the um, high cost of anticoagulations. Eloqua seems to be um, a very, very popular amongst providers. Um, and so we have definitely used this um, for patients because obviously we do not want them to have a stroke or, you know, a, 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 a BTE event. Um, and then again, a, the other programs like Lily, Sanofi, and the P Pennsylvania Drug Card. So there are a couple of uh, drug companies that do allow um, patient assistance programs for their insulin. And then there is the Pennsylvania drug card that is a statewide prescription assistance program card um, that we have, that I have shared with patients as well. We'll do a resend of it so we can get it out. Y'all can stay, but I'm sorry, I have to leave. But <laughs> thank you for everything you're doing and there's so much more to do. And I realize this is part of a process. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. Thank we you. Will. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, everyone. We convene. Take your time. Yeah, and send it out. Thank you so much. Take care. All right. Thank you. Uh -huh. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye.